Well, I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, and we're going to begin with verse 26, and we're going to go through to verse uh, 39. And if you read this text in Luke 8, 26 to 39, we're going to see that in that text, we see proof positive how Jesus can change and make a difference in a person's life. Here we have a man who is totally out of control. He is controlled by a hundred legions of evil spirits, running around naked in a graveyard, scaring people to death, and acting like a wild man. Jesus comes to him and immediately, notice that in the text, immediately his life is changed. He goes from being the most crazy person to likely, what I believe, to the most righteous person in that area. Now, I say that because if you read on into that text in 26 to 39, we see how the other people in the town react coldly toward Christ. And this morning, we're going to look and learn about three things about this man's life change that I believe mirrors the change that Christ makes in our lives when we come to him by faith. First is this. Jesus gives him new clothes. We're told in verse 35, the people went out to see what, kind, what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone out of, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, what? Clothed. You'll remember that he was naked while he was under the control of Satan. Verse 20, 27 said, who had not put on any clothing for a while. But here we see after the encounter with Jesus that he was had clothes on. So the question I is suggested, how did he get clothes? And I don't believe that I'm reading much into this, but I believe with all my heart that Jesus gave them to him. We are saved. And, uh, yeah. When we are saved, Christ gives us a garment to wear, doesn't he? According to Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10, it says, Isaiah writes, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul exalts in God in my God, for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Isaiah continues, he says, as a bridegroom, bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adores herself with her jewelry or jewels. Notice that Isaiah the prophet likens righteousness to a robe that we wear. Christ's blood is our robe of righteousness that we put on at the time of our salvation. Amen? When Christ gives his righteousness, it's like a perfect white garment that completely covers our sins. When God looks at our sins through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, he, we appear as white as snow. God does not see sin because they have been wiped away. Now, why do I say that? Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Luke writes this. He says, therefore, repent and turn so that your sins may be what? Wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, beloved, unfortunately, some people, and it's been this way for many, many years, but I believe more so today than ever before, some people are relying on their own righteousness to get them into heaven. They believe in their own minds that God judges based on a scale of goodness. And if your good deeds outweighs your bad deeds, they believe you go to heaven. So they are relying on their own righteousness. But here's what scripture says about that in Isaiah 64, verse 6. Our righteousness for all of us have become like one who is unclean, 
and our righteousness, our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. If a person, if you or if someone you know is relying on their own righteousness to get them into heaven, their own goodness to get them into heaven, beloved, according to Isaiah, you are relying on filthy rags. But God says we as believers are clothed with his righteousness, which comes through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, through scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. That's how you get to heaven. Number two, Jesus gave him a new mind. Look at verse 35, and especially the last part. Luke 8, verse 35, last part. This man was sitting down at Jesus' feet, clothed. We've already discussed that. But look at the last part. It says, and in his right mind. Not only had Jesus changed this man's outward appearance, but Christ had healed his thoughts as well. He no longer had a mind tormented by a legion of demons, but he had a new mind given to him by Jesus Christ. And listen, you and I, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are given a new mind, the mind of God. The mind of Christ. Paul the Apostle tells us over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him? He says, but we, he's talking about we as Christians, we have the mind of Christ. Paul tells us at the time of salvation, we have the mind of Christ. Now, do we grow in Christ? Oh, yes. And sometimes does it take time? Without a doubt. But beloved, we have the mind of Christ. And receiving the mind of Christ means that we, that he, God, gives us a new desires. If I could bring it down to simple forms, let me put it this way. It would be like me saying, I received a new want. What, what do I mean by that? I used to want to do this, what was good for me and what I wanted to do. But now, since I have that mind of Christ, I do what he wants me to do. The Bible teaches that without God drawing us, we wouldn't even desire, have a desire for Christ. Once God draws us and we yield by faith, God gives us a new desire to do his will. Here's what the word of God says over in Psalms 37 and verse 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I know that there are a lot of false blabbing and grab it, name it and claim it guys out there, that they take Psalm 37 verse 4, and they twist it, and they turn it, and they don't teach the right Hebrew understanding of that verse. And what these false claimant false prophets do is that they try to prove that God is nothing more than a genie in a bottle, ready to grant you every wish to fulfill every need of yours and every desire. Listen, to the key to this verse is this, delight yourself in the Lord. When you delight yourself in the Lord, his desires becomes your desires. You receive his mind and his desires. And when you come to Christ in faith, he not only gives you a new garment, but he also gives you a new mind with the desire to do his will and his will alone. Number three that we learn from this man, Jesus gave him a new mission. In verse 38 and 30. Five, up till now, this man was a poster child for satanic influence. Now he is a picture of how Jesus can change a life. And Jesus said to this man, go tell others what God has done for you. And the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 8, guess what? He does just that. We who know Christ as 
Lord and Savior, beloved, listen, we have been given a powerful mission. Matthew chapter 28 and verses 18, 19, and 20, but I'm only going to give you verse 19 this morning. You can read 18 and 20 later. But in Matthew ch in chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus says to the disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Beloved, this is what is referred to as the Great Commission. And if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, what does that mean? If you are a learner of his, if you have accepted him as Lord and Savior, that great commission given in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19 and 20, was not only given to the original guys, but it's given to you and I. We are to tell people about Jesus Christ. It's Christ's mission to us that we tell everybody we come into contact, that go therefore, a lot of people, man, I remember the first time I read that, I thought, my goodness, I have to go to the deepest, darkest part of Africa, or I have to go to wherever. No, I finally learned what it meant. When it says go, therefore, what it's saying is, hey, Valley, when you go to work, hey, when you go to school, when you go grocery shopping, when you go clothing shopping, you run into people, you tell them about me. That's what Jesus is saying. And it's Christ's mission, mission to us that we tell the world and we tell everybody we come into contact, uh, come into contact to about his saving power. I read this, and this, uh, the Barna Research Group did this survey a couple years ago, so it's a couple years old. Okay, so think of that, but I don't think it got any better. Barna Research Group stated that only 2% of the Christians, those who profess to be born-again believers, born from above, believers in Jesus Christ, actively share their faith. 2%. Now, if my math serves me right, okay, and I've always told you math was not my greatest subject, but if my math serves me right, that means for every 100 Christians, guess how many people are telling other people about Jesus Christ? Two. That's it. And I'm not talking about doing door-to-door -door evangelism. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about standing on some street corner of some city or some town and blaring out the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about someone talking to someone about what's going on in the world today and that someone looks at you or looks at me and says, man, this world is going crazy and I am so worried to death. That is the perfect opportune time, beloved, to tell them about your assurance of your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone and that you are not worried about it and that God is in control. It means listening to people, listening to their words and telling them why you have peace in this life. I'll never forget I met a man many, many years ago by the name of Bill Threlkill. And Bill was a perfect at this. He, he just listened so intently and one time he told the story that his daughter turned 14, 15 years old, and him and his wife, they were going to splurge and have a big party, and she could buy to however many of her little friends over, and that's what they did. And one of her, hit Bill's daughter's friends came up to him, and she said, oh, Mr. Threlkill, and she named the little girl. She goes, she is so lucky to have you as her father. And Bill's mind was like a still trap. She has a greater father than me. And he said, you could just see the look on the little girl's face. It was like, oh, no, I've stepped into something. You know, you're the stepdad or something like that. And she goes, well, what do you mean, Mr. Threlkill? And he named his daughter again. He said, her real father is God. And what she has is a gift from him. And it's greater than this little party and those gifts and all like that because you see 
she has salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, Bill said at that point, his daughter became upset with him because of all the kids that she had invited for her birthday party, they were all wrapped around Bill, and Bill was telling them about Jesus Christ. We need to listen and tell people about Jesus Christ and why you and I can have peace in this world that the rest of the world is thinking is falling apart. It's not falling apart, beloved. As one person said, it's not falling apart. It's coming together. It's coming together in God's timing. And you and I have the privilege to be here and to witness this. And we need to tell people about Jesus Christ. But you know what I've found out? Most people are afraid to tell people about Jesus Christ. And I've had them tell me this. There's, they've said, well, Bruce, I, I, just, I just don't know. And they stutter like I just did. Okay, I had to make up for that. They, they, they say, we don't understand. We don't know what to say. See, the Lord told this guy, and this guy did not go to seminary. The guy in the tombs. I don't believe he even said in a Sunday school class. I don't believe that he learned any of the basics of Christianity. But here's what Jesus said to him. He said, go tell your house what great things God has done for you. If you worry about telling somebody about Jesus Christ and you think, oh, I didn't go to seminary, I didn't go to Bible college, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, neither did, did this guy. And you don't have to be a Bible scholar. All you got to do is say like the blind man did. I was blind, but now I see. Or maybe like what Paul said. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Or maybe you want to emulate Peter. When Peter told the Pharisees in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, and there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The message of Jesus Christ is not a hard message to share, beloved. It's not. We just have to open our mouths and loosen that tongue and tell people what Jesus has done for you. They can't argue with that. They can argue theology. They can argue doctrine. But people cannot argue when you tell them what Jesus has done in your life. And the reason why they can't argue it is because it's fact and it happened to you. And no one knows it better than you and me. We need to tell people what God has done for us. Or maybe you want to be like Peter and John. Over in Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, those two guys said, For we cannot speak about what we have seen and heard. And beloved, that is the same for you and I. We have a mission to accomplish, and I will tell you, it is not always going to be an easy one. It is not always going to be fun because you might be, be considered an outcast by lost friends and lost family members. And nowadays, and maybe even in the future, there may be some physical persecution. prophets or the apostles from telling what Jesus had done for them. So why is this any different today? It's not. Our mission is the same. And when we think about it, the importance of fulfilling our mission, it becomes real. The word of God says that faith comes by hearing the word. If no one is preaching the word, 
I'm not talking about standing up behind a pulpit. Pre preaching just means to tell people, to speak it out. If no one is preaching the word of God, if no one is talking about Christ, if no one is bringing their family members and their friends to hear the word of God and to share the word of God, then will, will these people care about God? And the answer is they won't unless you and I speak up. Listen to the words of God to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 17. God is speaking to Ezekiel and he says, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. Now let's break that down for a moment. God speaks to Ezekiel, and he says, Ezekiel, old boy, I have placed you as a watchman. And we don't hear a lot about watchmen today, do we? Think of a sentry guy, somebody on guard duty, okay? And your job, sentryman, guard on guard duty, Watchman is to warn people of about impending danger. About end times prophecy, yes. What is going to happen in the end, amen? And that's why I'm just going to put a plug here. That's why we're here at Grace Baptist. That's why we teach Bible prophecy on Sunday night starting at 7 o'clock. 6 o'clock. <laughs> I knew the time. I was testing y'all at 6 o'clock. But it's to warn people, isn't it? It's not to warn believers because through the grace of God, we're going to be raptured out of here. But, beloved, I know that you have friends and I have friends. You have family. I have family that have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they're going to be here after the rapture, and we need to warn them of what life on this earth is going to be like. So we have to tell them. And we have to tell them that if they die before the rapture or if the rapture happens and they're left behind and they don't accept Christ as Lord and Savior, that when they do die, they will spend all eternity in a real place, beloved, in a real place called hell. And they can think all they want that their buddies are going to be there and it's going to be a big party. But, beloved, they are so mistaken. It's not going to be a party. It's going to be misery upon misery. And, beloved, God has given you and I the mission that he gave Ezekiel to be watch men or watch women and to, and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior with people, what he has done in your life. And here's the thing, and I have people that say, well, what if I share Christ and they don't accept Christ as Lord and Savior? Okay, let me explain. You share the gospel with somebody. And let's say that that person responds and they say, man, I want to be saved. Awesome. Praise God. That's amazing. But if they don't respond, beloved, listen, it's not your job. Your job is to tell them about Jesus Christ and what he's done in their lives and what he's done in your life. And then it's between them and God. That's all we're to do. We're not to play junior Holy Spirit. We can't drag people into heaven. I wouldn't want to if I did, if I could, because it wouldn't be them doing it on their own. I just have to tell people what God has done in my life and how he's changed me. And then I need to get out of the way. And I need to let God be God. And the same goes for you too. You tell your sisters. You tell your brothers. You tell your cousins. You tell your mom and dad. You tell your aunts and uncles, your co-workers, your friends, your neighbors what Jesus has done for you and then get out of the way and let God be God. 
Well, let's close with this. If you encounter Jesus Christ in your life, you are a believer. You need to be permeated in, to do the desires of God. You need to learn to do his will for your life. And I have a lot of people ask me that. They'll say, well, well, Brother Bruce, I, I'm just trying to figure out the will of God for my life. I can help with that. I can. God's will for your life may be for you to be a plumber. His will for your life may be a carpenter. His will for your life you just may be to be a mom, a dad, a school teacher. And you can name the occupation. And you'll look at me and you'll say, but that's what I already do. And my answer to you is, then do it. Then do it. But I believe that God's ultimate will is wrapped up in our text for this morning. God wants you to tell people, just like this guy went back home and told people about Jesus Christ and what he did for them or what he did for him. And God wants you to tell people that so that they, if being led by the Holy Spirit of God, puts on the righteousness of Christ. So whatever your occupation is now, do it. But do it unto the Lord. But as you're doing it unto the Lord, tell people about what Jesus has done for your life. But now, folks, let me say this. If you're listening to this this morning for whatever reason, and you don't have a union, you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and him alone, and you think your own good works and your own good deeds will save you, and that because of those things, you'll go to heaven. Beloved, I say this as lovingly as I know how. You are mistaken because of your own good works you will not go into heaven the Lord God says in his word that God only accepts perfection perfection of his son Jesus Christ dying on the cross and we are imperfect but we must put on the perfection of Christ to save us and to allow us into God's heaven. And folks, if we believe that God is drawing you to himself, you need to accept him as Lord and Savior by faith alone and put on his robe of righteousness by yielding to, by faith in him and start living the Christian life. Now, beloved, if you say, well, I've already done that. Okay, praise God. If you are a Christian, God wants you to have his mind. Do you think like God? Do you have his desires in your heart? Or do you, are you still playing with your own desires? I was going over my message this morning. And I got to this point because I go over it word by word by word. And when I got to that part, I just had to stop and I say, Lord... Make my desires your desires. I don't want to think anything. I don't want to do anything outside of being your thing and your desires. And if they are, call me up short, God, and help me to repent. Just because we're saved doesn't mean we don't face wanting our own desires at times. We do. But if, we have, if we're clothed in his righteousness and we have that new mind, then we will desire to do his will for us and to do his desires as well. And above all, beloved, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, listen. Again, don't play junior Holy Spirit, but tell people about Jesus Christ. 
You know people more than I'll ever get to know because they're in your circles. They're in your family. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Because, yes, it's true. One day the rapture is going to happen and we're all going to go to heaven. Man, we already get Pentecostal on that and just start shouting hallelujah. But, beloved, listen to me. You have family, you have friends that have not accepted Jesus Christ. And when the rapture happens, if they take the mark of the beast during the tribulation period, beloved, they are consigned to hell for all eternity. And you have the keys. I have the keys. The keys to the kingdom. What does that mean? Tell them about Jesus Christ. And then get out of the way. Beloved, our time on this earth, I believe, is short. I believe the rapture can happen at any moment. And I don't know about you, but I want to take as many people with me as I can. That means I need to open my mouth and tell people what Jesus has done in my life. And that's the end. But we've been clothed in his righteousness. We have a new mind. And we have a mission. And I believe it's high time that we as believers do and live that way. Let's quit playing games, beloved. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your text. And Father, we thank you for loving us the way you do. And I know I'm saying it again, but Father, and I, it may sound very shallow, but it, it comes from the heart. We thank you that you saved us. That you called us out of that life, maybe not as bad as some, but maybe worse than others. But for whatever reason, you look down through the corridors of heaven before the foundation of the earth. And you knew that we would be saved because you called us. Father, we thank you for that. Father God, I pray that we as believers, knowing full well, as we've said many times already this morning in this message, the rapture is imminent. It's, it's, it's going to happen quickly. So, Father, help us in the days that we have left to tell others what you have done for us and then leave the results to you because you are God. We love you. We pray. We thank you for our time together in your holy scriptures. Father, erase any stupid thoughts or sayings that I've done. And let the minds of the people turn nothing but to the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.